Hi. So for this lecture, I'm going to be talking about x-rays, how they're generated, um, and how we can use them to learn something more about uh, minerals. So the first thing I'm going to talk about is how are x-rays formed? Uh, what do the energy spectra of x-rays uh, look like? We use this for identifying minerals um, using electron beam instruments. Um, then I'm going to talk about Bragg's Law, um, which leads into the uh, um, technique of x-ray diffraction for identifying uh, crystal structures. And so by the end of this, I would hope that you would be able to say something about how x-rays are formed, um, how their relative energies depend on atomic number and electron shells, and then at least qualitatively how one might go about using energy dispersive spectroscopy, which is EDS, um, to identify minerals. Um, I'm going to go through Bragg's Law. I hope that you would be able to uh, use those diagrams to, uh, to explain where the mathematics comes from, and then be able to talk a little bit about practical applications of um, x-ray diffraction. So first let's talk about formation of x-rays. So x-rays were first discovered by Röntgen in um, 1895. And uh, it was really interesting. So he did this research. He took an x-ray photograph of his wife's hand. So that is that image right there. And back in the day, um, when you wrote an article and you wanted people to know about it, you would uh, you write a little note on it. Uh, dear von Kulliker, dear Albert von Kulliker, uh, I hope you uh, uh, enjoy reading my article, you know, best regards, uh, Röntgen, okay, write that on the, on the, uh, the reprint, you, the, the copy of the article, and you send it off to Albert von Kulliker. Um, and the thing is that when he did that, he included uh, this image, this x-ray image of his wife's hand, and uh, people just went crazy over it. They were like, oh my god you can see the inside of the human body, the bones, without having to, you know, cut it open. You can just image this directly. Well, doctors thought this was amazing for obvious reasons, and they, uh, they tried to get Röntgen to commercialize uh, his discovery, but he, he would never do it. He felt like, you know, science was meant to be shared by, um, by humanity, and so he wasn't going to commercialize it. Um, so here is, so this is the first x-ray in 1895. Look at the quality of the, of the second x-ray in, uh, in eight, or the, within a year, right? The, the quality had improved tremendously. So that was Rinken. And then von Lau, he um, figured out that x-rays are diffracted or, or bent um, by crystals. And he, he received a Nobel Prize for this, but there are lots of um, useful implications of this. Um, first of all, it implies that the particles, the atoms in crystals, have to be organized in three-dimensional patterns. They can't be randomly distributed. They have to be arranged in an orderly way. Um, it also implies that the spacings between the atoms have to be on the same order as the wavelength of, uh, of x-rays. Wavelength of x-rays is on the order of 1 to 10 angstroms, and that's about the difference, the distance between atoms in min minerals. Um, and, it, and it sets the stage for um, determining crystal structures using x-ray diffraction. And it also showed that x-rays are wave-like, like, so, so light uh, waves get diffracted. Um, and so this goes back to the debate back at, in uh, the late 1800s, early 1900s. About, um, about electromagnetic radiation. Is it, is it a wave? Is it a particle? Does it have wave-like characteristics, particle-like characteristics? The diffraction of x-rays is a wave-like characteristic. I want to mention, too, Fun Lao, he's a very interesting uh, story about this guy. Um, so he, he won the Nobel Prize, um, and he had to flee Germany uh, when the Nazis took over. Well, the Nazis were taking up gold, and so uh, there was another scientist there, uh, De Hevesy, I think is how you pronounce his name. And uh, they were very worried that the Nazis would take von Lau's uh, Nobel Prize. And so De Hevesy, what he did was he took it and he dissolved it in acid 
in aqua regia, and he put it in this bottle and like, set it in the back of a lab. And then he like, never paid attention to it. Well, after the war was over, there's this bottle of acid that has the Nobel Prize for Fong Lao. And uh, so the Nobel Prize Committee, they, uh, they got the gold back out of it, um, and they remade the uh, Fong Lao's um, Nobel Prize medal from that. It's a very interesting uh, way of getting around the, uh, the greediness of the Nazis. Oh, yeah, right. So <laughs> back to x-rays and, and, and crystallography. So um, the, the next uh, stage were the Braggs, um, Sir uh, William H. and William L. Bragg, uh, father and son, and the, uh, the elder Bragg invented x-ray spectrometers. So that's a way of, of producing and then detecting x-rays. And he actually showed that x-rays can be particle-like. And then there was the younger Bragg, and he developed Bragg's Law. And so essentially, the younger Bragg invented x-ray crystallography following on the elder Bragg's invention of x-ray spectrometers that allows you to do something uh, practical. Uh, with these sorts of uh, these sorts of concepts. Okay, so how do you make a, how do you make an X-ray? An X-ray. Um, an an X-ray is um, it's a little bit like a, it's a little bit like a like a light bulb. So you have this filament metal, and you uh, pass a current through it. Okay, so now it's really hot, and you subject it to an electric potential. And it's a high electric potential here, 15 to 60 uh, kilovolts. And if you have an electric potential, it will pull electrons off of that filament and accelerate them in the direction of the electric potential. When the electrons hit a, a material, in this case it's a, it's a foil, a target foil of metal, um, then the most of the energy that those electrons uh, impart to the target foil um, is lost as heat. Um, but there's, there are other interactions between the accelerated electrons and the electrons that are in the target. So there are two types of radiation that people talk about. One is called bremsstrahlung, which means breaking radiation. And this is a continuous spectrum. And it's basically as the electrons are slowing down as they move into the target material, then they're continuously releasing energy, and it produces a continuous spectrum of energy as a, as a function of wavelength. But what's very interesting, this is what's so useful about it, is that there are also x-rays that are called characteristic x-rays. And these form these little spiky bits on top of the continuous Bremsstrahlung uh, radiation. Now, there are different um, labels that we use for these. There's K-alpha, K-beta, L-alpha, L-beta, and so on, and I'll explain what those are uh, next. So what exactly happens here? So you have an electron that's coming in um, off of that filament. And just in this case, I'm, I'm choosing magnesium. You wouldn't use magnesium as your target, but just as an example. So that electron comes in, zoom, 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 hits an electron in the magnesium atom, and in this case we're going to choose a K-shell electron, and it knocks that electron out of its orbital. So here's that K-shell electron that goes flying off, and here's the incident electron. And what does that do? It leaves a hole. It leaves a hole in that inner shell. And what's going to happen? Well, if you have an electron that's in the next shell, it can drop down into the, the empty hole here. Now, there's a particular energy for this shell, and there's a particular energy for this shell. This one is lower than this one. And so if you take a high energy, uh, potential energy electron, and you drop it into a low potential energy uh, electron space, it will release radiation. And so in this case, it releases um, an energy that is equal to 1.254 kilo electron volts. Okay, now that's gonna be a fixed energy. Why is it a fixed energy? Because the energy of the K-shell electrons has a fixed value, and the energy of the L-shell electrons has a fixed value. 
And so these two are going to be offset by the same amount. And so the amount of energy that gets released is going to be the same for all magnesium atoms, where a K shell electron is removed and an L shell electron falls into, into its place. That's not the only way that electrons can, um, can be replaced here. So you can also take uh, an electron from uh, not the L shell, but the M shell. So the M shell electron can drop into the K shell space. And this is at an even higher energy. So if you drop an M shell electron into the K shell, you'll have a higher uh, energy. So in this case, 1.302 kilo electron volts much less likely for this to happen than for this to happen, but it still does happen and it has a different energy. So which of these following spectra would you think are going to be most representative of magnesium K alpha and K beta? So this is the intensity, this is likelihood that you're going to get that, uh, that x-ray, and then this is increasing energy in this direction. And the answer here is A. It's more likely that you're going to get a K-alpha X-ray because that means that the L-shell electron is dropping into the K-shell space rather than an L-shell electron. So K-alpha should be higher than K-beta. But K-beta has the higher energy. So here, these, this can't be correct because these are equal probability. This says that the K-beta is more likely to fall in, which is not true. Um, and this one says that the K-alpha X-ray has a higher energy than the K-beta. And, and, and it's the reverse. So, so this is what it would have to be. Now, um, the same kind of process occurs with all of the atoms that are in a compound. Um, and because all of the atoms have different energies for their K-shell electrons, L-shell electrons, M-shell electrons, and so on, um, they're going to have different energies. So if you look at the um, K alpha energy for oxygen, so we knock out a K shell electron and re we replace it with an L shell electron, that has an energy drop that's 0.525 kilo electron volts. So that's the oxygen K alpha. Whereas with the magnesium K alpha, we were just talking about that, that energy difference gives off an X-ray with an energy of 1.254 kilo electron volts. Both K alpha, different compounds, uh, different atoms rather, um, different energy levels. So they have different X-ray energies uh, for their K alpha radiation. And so um, if you see an energy that is specific to an X-ray, um, then you can identify uh, what the element is that is in that material. Um, and so, for example, you know that oxygen has a, uh, an energy of 0.525, magnesium has an energy of 1.254. So if you are collecting a spectrum and you see a lot of counts uh, at 0.525 kilo electron volts and moderate number of counts at 1.254, you know you've got a lot of oxygen and a moderate amount of magnesium in there. The X-ray energies tend to increase as you go up the um, up in atomic number. So oxygen is going to be the lowest of, of these two. Magnesium is going to be higher. If we had um, silicon, that's going to be higher. Uh, calcium, higher still. Iron, higher still. There are some complications. I'll get into that in a little while. But this is a very straightforward way that we use to identify minerals using electron beam instruments. So at this point, I would hope that you could explain how x-rays are formed, the filament and the uh, electric potential, and then how their relative energies depends on the atomic number and the electron shells, basically how those electrons are moving from one shell to another shell, and then just the fact that the energies of the, the energy drop as you go up the periodic table tends to get larger and larger with increasing atomic number. Okay, now we're at a point where we can start thinking about how we would use X-ray energies to um, identify uh, compounds and minerals. This is the, um, the energy dispersive spectrum for anorthite. 
And remember that the energies, K alpha energies, increase with increasing atomic number. Now I should point out that all of the materials that we analyze conventionally in, um, in geology, they, they have to be coated with something that is electrically conductive. So you know, you're, you're shooting electrons at a, at a sample, and if you don't have something that's electrically conductive, then you build up charge. And, uh, and that destroys your ability to generate x-rays. Um, so because most materials, silicates, oxides, and so on, um, are not very electrically conductive, um, we have to coat the, the sample with something that is electrically conductive. And for that, we uh, conventionally, we use carbon. So if you look at this spectrum, you're going to see a little bitty peak down here for carbon. That's from the carbon coat. So, so we don't have to pay attention to that. If you have a carbonate, well, then you got to then you got to pay attention to it. You have a big carbon peak here. But this little carbon peak, that's just from the carbon coat. So if you look at this spectrum, you'll see that it has oxygen, aluminum, silicon, and calcium. And you can see that the atomic number is increasing 8, 13, 14, and 20. And you can see that the peak heights are in some way related to concentration in, in terms of the atom uh, proportions, um, but not quite. So if you look at aluminum, aluminum to silicon should be two to two, and they're high, but they're not identical. Calcium is very high, um, much higher than you would anticipate given its proportion to aluminum. There's half as much calcium as aluminum. And oxygen is very, very low down here. Now, why is that? It's because the x-rays aren't um, developed, uh, or sorry, aren't generated uh, uniformly, right? Just because you have twice as much of an element doesn't mean you necessarily get twice as many x-rays. There's lots of other interactions that go on. Um, but there's another factor that comes into play, which is that the detectors that we use here are not uniform in their sensitivity. And so you very rarely get much sensitivity down here. A peak like this for oxygen actually means there's a lot of oxygen in this material. And that's what I was just saying. Peak height's not quite proportional to concentrations. Here you can see two, uh, two peaks. There's a big peak here for calcium. There's a little peak here. This big peak is the K-alpha peak. It's more likely for an L-shell electron to fall into the K-shell hole than for an M-shell electron to fall into the K-shell hole. And so this peak is going to be higher than this peak. But remember that if you're dropping an M-shell electron into the K-shell hole, you're generating a lot more energy than if you do an L-shell electron into a K-shell hole. And so the energy up here is higher. And so this is what I was talking about within that previous slide about the relative intensities and energies of the K-alpha and K-beta peaks. So now here's a spectrum for barite. Barite is uh, barium sulfate. So there's, there's barium and sulfur and uh, oxygen over here. Now, barite, barite has no titanium in it, or yeah, trivial amounts. Um, doesn't have molybdenum, and it doesn't have cerium. And so why is the software identifying these weird elements in here, cerium and titanium and, and molybdenum? All these other elements, there can be some calcium in a barite. There might be some silicon uh, contamination. Um, but these other elements, they're, they're not in there. So the thing is that the K-shell x-rays are not the only x-rays um, that can be produced. There can be L x-rays also. And so we go back to the magnesium atom. You knock out a K-shell electron, and you replace it with an L-shell electron. Well, that's K-alpha, and it has an energy of 1.25. You can do the same thing with calcium. You can knock out a K-shell electron, replace it with an L-shell electron, and the energy would be, uh, what, what was it here? Calcium is a little under 4. 4 for K-beta, 3.8 for, uh, for K-alpha. L-alpha, much lower, much lower energy. And so as we look at the K-alpha peaks, those that are marching up in this direction, we look at L-alpha peaks, well, there's a calcium L-alpha that's down here. 
And so as we move out in the different shells, we're now developing other energies for L alpha and so on. And so it, it turns out that for uh, this part of the energy uh, spectrum between about four and six kilo electron volts, the titanium K alpha 4.5 turns out to be very similar to the barium L alpha 4.5. And so when the software looks at this big peak, it doesn't know a priori, is this a barium L-alpha peak or a titanium K-alpha peak? So you have to be a little careful about, about how you interpret this. It turns out that for barium, there are multiple peaks. That's another barium peak. That's another barium peak. There's another barium peak here. And so as you become more practiced with this, then you can realize that, oh, yeah, the titanium is not significant here. The cerium is not significant here. And it's the same thing with molybdenum. There's, there's some other peak for molybdenum that overlaps with sulfur. Here. So if we think, uh, if we consider um, the spectrum for forsterite, uh, Mg2SiO4, which of these spectra would be uh, most likely to be representative of the energy spectrum? Okay, so magnesium is a lower atomic number, higher than oxygen, but lower than silicon. So magnesium 2, you'd expect it to have a higher uh, intensity, lower energy than silicon. And remember, oxygen's got a lot more oxygen than magnesium, but it has a much lower uh, intensity. It's just idiosyncrasy of, of oxygen in these sorts of detectors. So um, with a periodic table and you know, some thinking about the distribution of uh, electrons around atoms, I, I think you might be able to use energy dispersive spectroscopy to, um, to be able to begin to tease apart uh, one mineral from another. If you, if you had peaks at particular elements and you could look at the relative peak heights, you might be able to uh, sort out uh, what, the, uh, what the mineral might be.